Psalm 37, verse 1, Fret not yourself because of the ungodly, neither be envious of those who are evildoers. From Habakkuk, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. From our gospel, increase our faith, Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Reading these passages this morning, I, thinking about faith, I can't help but think of what just happened in Florida this past week with Hurricane Ian. And why I can't stop thinking about that is because that was our home for seven years. And while we were in Florida, we boarded up our house on three separate occasions for hurricanes. The first time we boarded up our home uh, was for a hurricane that I can't even remember the name. But the reality of that particular hurricane, it came in around 2015. But because St. Cloud is in the center of the state and where it was coming from, at least the direction of that hurricane, particular hurricane, it only hit us as a minor tropical storm, though it did hit the Gold Coast as a Category 1. We didn't have a whole lot of damage, and there was just a lot more flooding, there's just a lot of down tree branches and, and some down trees, but it really wasn't that bad. The cleanup took about a day. Now the next hurricane we boarded up for was Hurricane Irma. Do you remember Hurricane Irma at all? I remember it very clearly. This one was a doozy, and it made landfall right at the tip of the Florida, where the Keys are, right near Key West. And it went straight up the spine of Florida. From the very tip, it went straight up, right through the middle. And when it hit us, after about 250 miles from the tip to where we were, it hit us as a Category 1 hurricane. And this storm did do some damage and created major problems with some flooding. In fact, the flooding where we lived, the water got all the way up to our front porch, but not into our home. The storm did some damage and created major problems, and like I said, with some flooding. But both these storms that we boarded up for did not affect our communities too badly. That second hurricane, we did do a lot of community cleanup, but mostly it was debris that simply took time and elbow grease to clean up. For me, though, the scariest hurricane that we ever faced was Hurricane Dorian in 2019. This particular hurricane was coming at a latitude much higher than the other two hurricanes. And normally, hurricanes come up from the south through the Caribbean. They either go into the Gulf Coast and they hit Texas, Louisiana, or Mississippi, or Alabama. Or they get hit by a high pressure system within the Gulf and they push it back through across Florida. But Dorian was on a different path. It came straight at us from the east and moved east to west, going only slightly north. Hurricanes always turn north. That's important for you to know in this story. But Dorian was not budging on its westerly path, and by the time it had hit Grand Bahama Island, it was a Category 5 hurricane. Do you remember that? 2019? Now, the day before it was set to hit, we boarded up our house and we watched the trajectory of this hurricane like everyone else on TV. And you know what else we did? We prayed. We prayed. We prayed and prayed and prayed. The entire community prayed. The entire country prayed. The entire world prayed. So when Hurricane Dorian hit Grand Bahama Island as a Category 5 and stopped dead in its tracks, we didn't know what to think. For two hours, the eye of Dorian, a Category 5 hurricane, hovered over the beautiful islands of the Bahamas and utterly devastated Grand Bahama Island and Grand Abaco Island. Now, it's important to know that Grand Bahama Island is 60 miles to the west of, Saint, of, of the coast. And it is exactly 105 miles, almost due west, to where we were living in St. Cloud. And this hurricane was just going straight across. 
So with Hurricane Dorian, remember, category five, it was 105 miles from our house and wasn't moving. We didn't know why. But after, as I said, staying directly over Grand Bahama Island for several hours, all of a sudden, Dorian did a 90 degree turn north. Just 90 degrees to the right, went straight north. These hurricanes go like this, they curve. This one hit a wall and went straight north, 90 degrees. Not even the coast of Florida was hit with category one winds. It was only hit with tropical storm force winds and we had a lot of rain, but not a lot of wind. And we couldn't help but think, what in the world just happened? Before you say prayers happen, and that's what stopped it, I do want to be perfectly clear that the Bahamas were decimated, utterly destroyed. And Dorian, moving due north, went straight up into South Carolina like Hurricane Ian just did. But why did Hurricane Dorian stop? Well, there was a scientific reason behind it. There was a high-pressure system that came from the Arctic routed through Washington and Oregon, then across the plains, and then to the Gulf. And then it hit it dead on, right off the coast of Florida. And this Arctic high pressure system was so powerful that it stopped Dorian in its tracks, weakened its intensity, and pushed it north. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted, planted into the sea, and it would obey you. Now, I do have to tell you that even though there's a scientific explanation for what happened, I still believe that through faith, Florida was spared the full force of Hurricane Dorian. And yes, there was massive destruction in the Bahamas and in South Carolina, but if Dorian would have hit the east coast of Florida, where it was supposed to, as a Category 5, right where the Kennedy Space Center was, then the damage may have not just been catastrophic, but it would have been biblical. So it is a wonder why it was that with the same communities praying, and the same nation praying, and the same world praying, was it that Florida was not spared the utter devastation of Hurricane Ian. The greatest destruction was where Ian made landfall near Fort Myers. Now think about the population density of Los Angeles, yet not so spread out. That is Fort Myers. It's like a hurricane hitting right, category five, right in Los Angeles. Yet if you saw where all the massive flooding was in Central Florida, where all the rescues for the airboats were happening, you would actually have been in my backyard. In fact, I saw a drone shot of the hospital I visited the most. It's called Osceola Regional Medical Center. It's 15 minutes from the church. And Osceola, Osceola Medical Center was completely flooded. During Hurricane Irma, the waters came up to our front porch. I'm told that with this hurricane that our home was likely flooded and that the neighborhood was very much underwater <laughs> and was right next to a lake. And our house is the second house in from the lake. I still don't know that for certain, but I do know I do love the view from my front porch of my old house. Now, I will tell you that many of our friends are reporting that our community is okay and that the waters receded rather quickly and that St. Cloud, where we live, was spared the worst. And that the utter devastation that we're looking at on TV, though, was right in our backyard. And so many of those communities that we shared fellowship with, and which our church is with, that were filled with our friends and colleagues, faithful men and women of God, who today, as they endeavor to clean up, to serve their communities, and to find ways to help the least of these, they too were praying in earnest. And I have no doubt that they had faith more than the mustard seed. <coughs> the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. 
I use this hurricane as a backdrop to this idea that the apostles are asking for an increase of faith. The apostles' words come directly on the heels of difficult teachings. Jesus has been sharing for the ears of the Pharisees and all those around him to hear. Remember three weeks ago when Jesus said to the Pharisees, which of you having 100 sheep, having one run off, would not leave the 99 and go and search for the one lost sheep? That God rejoice and the angels rejoice over the one sinner who repents? Remember reading two weeks ago, Jesus told the parable of the dishonest manager and the importance of being a faithful steward? Remember these words? One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. Remember last week when Jesus tells the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in which the rich man when faced with the utter destruction of his life and the soul begs Abraham to send Lazarus to his brothers so that they might repent, find faith, and serve God well? Well, all these readings lead up to the apostles' cry this morning, increase our faith. Lord, no, not us. Increase our faith. We don't want to end up like the lost sheep, the dishonest manager, and God forbid, the rich man in hell. At first, Jesus' response to the apostles might make sense. The apostles are crying out for faith, and Jesus tells them even a grain of faith can do the impossible. And so we might feel that the response of the apostles would be, Okay, I've got that much faith. What can I do now? How? I can do the impossible. I can do what you're doing, Jesus. But then Jesus continues his mixed words. Like they, it's like they come out of left field, or maybe like a hurricane. <laughs> this is what he says. He says, he tells the apostles that even a little bit of faith can do the impossible. Yes, even a Category 5 hurricane, it can veer it off course. But when that faith is practiced and God's delivers, the apostles themselves are always to recognize that it's not they who get the credit, but God. That's why he goes on to talk about the servant and the responsibility of the servant. Oh, how often when we pick, pull off miraculous feats or say, I want recognition for the good that I have done, the faith that I have manifested, the service I have rendered, yet we do these things because we want to make it about us, about our work, about our glory. It's our faith that did the work. Look at what I did. I turned a hurricane. Saying these things can quickly become, oh no, the hurricane did turn, and it didn't hit me, but now it's going somewhere else. And now someone else will not be spared. Someone else who had just as much faith as I have. Someone who prayed just as hard. When we get to that point, we might then be, I, I would say, might be, we'd be susceptible to one, to having the pride that we are the ones responsible. But then on the other end, when it doesn't go our way, we get to that point in which we throw everything away because the God who we had trust in did not act on our behalf. How could he? Well, I believe that this text that we have this morning and this attitude of faithfulness that Jesus calls us to and this servanthood and faithfulness that he calls us to begs too many questions. Too many questions that I can't address them all here. Like why do bad things happen to good people? The Old Testament in which bad people are conquering and overrunning the good. But I can address today one aspect of our text. And the text at hand in the gospel that says faith, increasing our faith, what I want to say about that is that remember that faith is not about us. It's about God. That's why so little is required for God to do such great things, like plant a mulberry tree into the ocean. The work we are called to is not about us. The prayers we are called to offer are not about us. The service we render to God is not about us. 
It's all about him. And when we make it about us, what it becomes is this. We say, God, where is my reward? When do I get to receive the benefits and blessings of the master? Lord, it's about my comfort, my joy. Jesus tells the apostles, and he tells us that what we offer to God is simply this. We offer to God, by faith, only that which is our duty. And that sometimes is a very difficult thing to live out. But the next time we look to God and ask for more faith, or more responsibility, or more influence, or more gifting, remember that it is by faith that we receive and practice such things. And when and if God gives them to us, he does so not for ourselves, but for his glory, for his kingdom. And we are simply stewards. And we are to ask for faith so that we might bring about God's glory and to bless the world for his purposes and not our own. So then when we ask for faith, we ask God to increase in us faith. Let us also ask it with these words as well. Lord, increase our faith, for we are unworthy servants. We only seek to do that which is our duty. And when the time comes, God's response will be to us, as it will be to the, par to the master, that it will be the same response to us that God wrote. I just messed up the ending of my sermon. Look at that. <laughs> when we say we are unworthy servants, we've only done what was our duty, I truly believe that if that is at the heart of who we are and why we ask for faith and why we live out our Christian life, then at the very end, when we say we have only done what is our duty, like the master in Jesus' parable in Matthew 23, in the parable of the talents, what God will say to us is, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And so what am I getting at with all these things here? About the working hand of God. About our faithfulness and our call to service and to prayer. Our call to say it is not about our prayers, but about who God is and our faith and trust in Him. My friends, it all comes down to this. By faith, let us know and receive the love and power and glory of God in our lives. And by faith, may we reflect it in the world. Not for our own benefit or our own glory, but for the glory and benefit of God, whose purpose is in the world to bring all men, all men, unto himself. And we are simply stewards and servants of his purposes. Amen? Amen. Amen.